But we're going to go ahead and get started. We're on the last week of Old Testament survey. We made it. <laughs> so good job, everybody. Afterwards? Yeah, we'll have a, a little. Man, that would be fun. <laughs> um, our party will be the church service. <laughs> um, yeah, in this next hour, we're going to overview the last four books of the Old Testament. Uh, we've worked our way up towards Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. And if you can believe it, uh, since September, we covered some genre stuff, some intro world stuff, and then Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings, 1st, 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalm, Proverbs, Song of Songs, Ecclesiastes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Jeremiah, Jesus, Obadiah, John, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, and now we're here. And I had a funny anecdote. My Old Testament professor in undergrad, he was, uh, he started his Old Testament class by saying, I can do all the Old Testament books in one breath. And he did, he like took this huge breath and then just takes a little bit, and he, you know, to articulate it too, he obviously had to practice that was one of his tricks, but it was pretty impressive. And then after he did that, and we were all clapping, he said, now, if you can believe it, I can do all 66 books of the Bible, Old and New Testament, in one breath. Oh. And he did, and that was, oh my wow. Gosh. I had thought about trying to do that for this, and I was like, no, I just, just <laughs> get a few breaths in there. Really? Yeah. But, uh, yeah, so here we are. So I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we will get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this uh, these last few months where we've been able to slowly and intentionally, uh, but also very quickly, walk through your Old Testament that you've given us to reveal your character, uh, your word, um, how you desire us to live, how to understand the world around us. Um, Lord, thank you for these books. Thank you for these books we're going to go through this morning, and I pray that um, this time that we've spent over the last few months uh, can help form and shape our own personal spiritual growth, our own relationship with you, um, and help grow us together more strongly as a church as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Okay, so starting off with Zephaniah. Would somebody volunteer to read Zephaniah's first statement? Go for it. The purpose of the prophecies of Zephaniah was to initiate change in Judah by pronouncing God's judgment on wickedness. Coupled with God's intention to punish came the proclamation of his intention to restore Judah. The message of Zephaniah was focused on the day of the Lord, which he contended was fast approaching. Very good, thank you. So, historical context for Zephaniah. Um, he's going to be the last of our pre-exilic prophets. Um, he's uh, right here on this chart, which should also be in your notes, kind of in the transition between Assyria and Babylon as the major world power. And during the reign of Josiah, which, uh, as you'll remember from our historical books, was a very uh, good portion of Israel's history. Josiah was a very good king, instituted a lot of religious reform, um, and that's right where Zephaniah um, comes into the picture. Uh, so in three short little chapters, um, the major theme that comes out, as was already said in the purpose statement, is the day of the Lord. Um, he goes kind of right into it in the first chapter, and um, Hill and Walton define it as the expression, the day of the Lord, was used by the prophets to indicate the time when the current state of affairs would be replaced by the Lord's intended order of things. And so I think it's helpful to view this term also, how the prophets and the Old Testament Israelites would have viewed it. I think we can come into this term often thinking of the very end times, thinking of when Jesus is going to come back and everything for all eternity is going to be set right. Um, and I think there's definitely, uh, that's part of this as well. Um, but they would have thought of them a little more broadly than that. Um, so, in, in a sense, the, the decline and final overthrow of the kingdom of Assyria, uh, that would have been a day of the Lord. Um, and so, so they, they could happen more 
than once um, in different ways. It's kind of, like I said, that God's establishing his order um, over the current state of affairs. And so often the imagery in this um, day of the Lord is often kind of like a world turned upside down imagery where the, the people who were oppressed kind of gain victory, the, the poor will become rich, um, the, pr the proud will be laid low, the humble will be exalted, those kinds of, kinds of imagery. And so um, when Israel and Judah had this idea, the day of the Lord, when they were often oppressed, they always positioned themselves kind of in that lower, uh, more oppressed position, waiting for God to vindicate them and give them victory. And the message of Zephaniah includes this, but also includes a message and judgment for Judah as well, saying, yes, God loves you and he will restore you and he will give you victory, but also uh, you have judgment coming for you also. There will be a day of the Lord for Israel as well because of uh, your faithlessness uh, to heed the covenant. And so, uh, but there's always that message of hope even while they will experience judgment as well, that um, a faithful remnant will remain after that uh, pruning, so to speak. Um, so I pulled some verses out that I'm going to read from Zephaniah 3. On that day you shall not be put to shame because of the deeds by which you have rebelled against me. For then I will remove from your midst your proudly exalted ones, and you shall no longer be haughty in, the, in my holy mountains. But I will leave in your midst a people humble and lowly. They shall seek refuge in the name of the Lord. Those who are left in Israel, they shall do no injustice and speak no lies. Nor shall there be found in their mouth a deceitful tongue. For they shall graze and lie down, and none shall make them afraid. So, a uh, discussion question I have for you guys that you can spend about five minutes on. Um, uh, <clears throat> before Israel was to experience it, victorious day of the Lord. It didn't need to experience a judgmental day of the Lord where the proud and haughty would be pruned from their her midst. Um, so my question to you to discuss is, have you personally, or a church that you were a part of, ever experienced such a pruning um, where God kind of humbled the proud, uh, either as a community or the pride within yourself, some character traits that needed to be leveled out? Because um, that's kind of the message we see in Zephaniah. So go ahead and spend about five minutes or so talking this, and then we will go on to the next one. Who would like to share what your group talked about? I could always start with my own thoughts, but I do a lot of talking. We sort of use the analogy of as well, part of the conversation, using the analogy of a tree, okay. or sometimes you just have to prune it a little bit, mm -hmm. get what you, you know, and then sometimes you have to really prune it severely to yeah. be able to. To get rid of the dead stuff so that it can fully flourish. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So the imagery of you know, tending a garden or a tree mm -hmm. is what they were talking about. So that's very good. And Jesus teaches similar things. Mm -hmm. So very good. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Kevin. We were talking about what church Churches that have major problems when there's a pastor who doesn't have a crisis or scandal, mm -hmm. as well as just churches that maybe don't have something quite so dramatic, but people just slowly or quickly leave, or the yeah. new pastor comes in with a different vision, and a couple years later, almost nobody that was there is there anymore. Yeah. And it's still, you know, there's still a church, there's a new group of people, but it's like yeah. the old community sort of gets pruned off and disappears and this new group comes and it's like is this even still the same church? Yeah. And it is and isn't. <clears throat> yeah. And it's hard sometimes to know, is this God doing something new? Is this something bad? Sure. How do we interpret that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, and I think kind of in that same light, because I I've been in the mega church world, just the the idea that if you focus so much on numerical growth, you you're, you might be hindering your spiritual growth mm -hmm. because you're too afraid to speak truth, which might prune some people off so you can really truly grow. Some people might be there not truly as Christians or as just 
followers of Jesus, but as consumers who just are hit there for an experience. Um, yeah. So we've got a more personal side and a more church side. All right. Any others before we move on? All right. Have you had Thank you guys a short little book, two chapters. It's the second shortest after Obadiah. Um, would somebody like to read the purpose statement of Haggai? The purpose of the book of Haggai is to initiate the reconstruction of the Temple of Yahweh in Jerusalem upon the return of the Hebrews from Babylonian captivity. Very good, thank you. So, um, Right after the return, so that we're now after the exile, um, Zephaniah was over here. So the exile has happened. They uh, have returned from uh, Babylon, and now this is just before the Jerusalem Temple was built. And so, if you remember from the <clears throat> from the narratives of Ezra and Nehemiah, that they come back, Zerubbabel takes a whole bunch of group back to rebuild the temple. And uh, they start construction, but then they soon give up because of some political pressures and outside pressures from different nations. Um, and it stalled for some 20 years. And the purpose of Haggai's ministry, prophetic ministry, was to stir the people back up to finish the temple. So the major theme, you could have guessed it maybe, was <laughs> is the temple. Um, Hill and Walton describe it as Haggai was a prophet of a solitary mission. His task was to initiate the reconstruction of the temple of God, which had been sacked and plundered by the Babylonians nearly 70 years earlier. And so um, there's some nuances to his, um, to his writings in the sense that like, it's not just the fact that, hey, we just need to get this done. Um, there's obviously spiritual levels and ramifications to it. Um, Hill and Walton note that by the time of Jeremiah, so before uh, the exile, the temple had kind of become to be seen as this like lucky charm of sorts for the Israelites, kind of that physical manifestation of God with us, uh, which they had done much earlier also with um, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, they would like bring it out into battle uh, as eight other ancient Near Eastern cultures did, uh, physically symbolizing their deity's presence with them. And so he had to kind of you know, combat that idea as well. Um, and so, um, if you read the book of Haggai, um, even the Lord says, there's probably some among you that saw the former temple, you know, the Solomon, uh, Solomon's temple, that which was great. And we know from reading the narrative that people who were there saw it and just cried because it wasn't to the same level of, of glory. And so, um, even Yahweh in Haggai says, says the same thing. He said, compared to that thing, this thing is, is nothing. Um, but then he goes on to say that this, this second temple, this temple that you're building right now and will build, um, will be filled with greater glory than, than the first temple. And um, so that's from Haggai 2.9. He says, the glory of this present house will be greater than the glory of the former house, says the Lord Almighty. Um, and in a sense, this is, this is true because this is the messianic hope that the Messiah that is to come is going to uh, dwell and reign here from the temple. And so it's just kind of interesting to have this physical representation of uh, the temple and God's presence um, and seeing that it wasn't as glorious or maybe didn't appear as glorious as Solomon's temple, um, but it will be filled with greater glory because of the Messiah to come. Now, is, if I may ask a question, is this then the temple that was standing when Jesus, mm -hmm. so it yeah. lasted the 400 years? Yeah, which eventually got destroyed about 70 AD okay. by the Romans. Um, and it, so this constructed, uh, by the time um, Herod came about, um, he did a lot of rebuilding, even, or I guess like, Renovating, I don't know how you would say it, but he just <laughs> built it up to be even greater okay. uh, than what it was built at this time in about, um, this would be the 5th century BC. Um, so yeah, that's a good question. Okay, so um, maybe just spend quick five uh, minutes on this.
I see a, I see a yeah, spiritual principle here, this 20-year yeah. thing. It must be, because we duplicated it here at this church. How many remember making faith available in the 21st century, right around 2000? Remember that? Mm -hmm. We were going to get this church ready for the 21st century. We put it in an elevator and did a couple things, but we didn't really get the whole job done. Mm -hmm. And 20 years later, Nate Haggai uh, <laughs> comes along and says, guys, this church is not ready for the 21st century. Uh -huh. And hey, that's pretty so exciting. I think we, you know, we, we said we were going to do it back then, but it was kind of a feeble effort. And now we finally we finished the job. So I'm just kind of Yeah, sorry. that's cool. But it yeah. took somebody to come along and say, hey guys, yeah. look around. It's not what we need. Yeah, that sounds actually really similar to this situation. They started a good work and it stalled out and then... Yep. A prophet, prophetic voice. So the nickname for Nate, you call Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. So we can spend just a little bit about this. Um, they had kind of grown complacent, you know. They were uh, there's a, a verse in the first chapter about you know you're so comfortable in your homes, but this home of mine was just laying unbuilt. Um, and so, in what ways can we focus on our own homes? I put that in quotes because I'm not talking about our actual homes, but just how can we be comfortable with where we're at when there's a greater work that needs to be done that we need to be stirred up to go do? And the Lord's house is in quotes too because it's, it's like that, um, more metaphorically. So, um, maybe spend just about five minutes doing that and then we'll move on to uh, Zacharias. All right. Who would like to share? <laughs> Who would like to share with the group? Well, our last, our last thing that we hear was, yeah. do you mean in what ways can we focus on our own homes, or do you mean in what ways do we? Because mm. it's a completely different discussion. Oh, yeah. Both okay. are valid discussions. But, but you deliberately chose can. Yeah. <laughs> Where we were operating under do. Okay. We didn't write it that well. <laughs> To be honest, when I wrote it, I thought more of the do sense. <laughs> the ways do we? So, pardon the grammatical But this confusion, could be the next discussion. Probably. Yeah, this could be the yeah. next discussion. Yeah. yeah. So well, what did you have to say for the, in what ways do we focus on? <laughs> <laughs> Prioritizing. Prioritizing, yeah. Prioritizing. Just like having your priorities out of whack? Or? Um, well, for example, are you going to... Add, do that addition on your house, or are you going to help the church with mm -hmm. getting the 21st century? Sure, thing? yeah, it's a very practical application of that. Which one is needs to be prioritized? Yeah, very good, thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead, Gene. We, we kind of got into a conversation on you know how do we personally handle our finances, which turned into tithing. Yeah, <laughs> you know, it's not a legalistic thing, that's kind sure. of most of us have come to. Yeah. It's a guideline. Yep. And yet, when things come along like a stimulus check, mm -hmm. you know, and maybe God wants us to do something with that. Yeah. It's not something we were counting on. So. Yeah, so. for sure. <clears throat> Very good. Yeah. And I think that lines right up with priorities too, right? Mm -hmm. I think tithing is a great example of how you set priorities with your with your money to show that everything that I have is not mine; it comes from God. And yeah. Very good. Anybody else? All right, we can move on. We got two more books to go. There's a lot in Zechariah. The largest of the four books we're covering today, about 14 chapters. I should say about it is 14 chapters. <laughs> uh, I'll go ahead and read this for the sake of time. Zechariah is a tract for troubled times. First, the prophet rebuked the people for perpetuating the evil ways and deeds of their ancestors. He exhorted them to repent and return to God in a renewed covenant relationship that demonstrated social justice. <coughs> Finally, the prophet offered the people of Judah encouragement and hope for the future with promises of God's blessing and restoration. So Zechariah was also a post-exilic prophet. He was a contemporary of Haggai, um, whereas... Haggai was more concerned with building the, the physical temple. Um, Zechariah was more concerned with Israel rebuilding spiritually. Um, and so there are two major themes, which we will hit pretty quickly, um, but there's a lot in here. Uh, the first one is the Messiah. 
And I have a chart on the back of that sheet, if you flip, which is also here, but I gave it to you in your notes. Um, Zechariah, uh, they describe, uh, Hill Walton describes Zechariah as, um, other than the book of Isaiah, this short little book has more to say about the Messiah uh, than any other book in the Old Testament, again, except for Isaiah. So it's filled uh, with oracles that are, when you read it, are kind of that uh, Old Testament apocalyptic literature type where an angel's carrying him around, showing him different visions that are very symbolic, interpreting them, here's what they mean. Um, and, you know, the, probably one of the more famous one is Zechariah 9.9. Uh, rejoice greatly, O daughter uh, of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, <coughs> on a co colt, on the foal of a donkey. Um, but uh, we're not going to go through all these, obviously, for time, but I put them in your notes, so if you wanted to go through them, uh, there's all the verses from Zechariah and then the corresponding uh, New Testament passages as well. So all throughout Zechariah's book, he's talking about um, the Messiah is a major theme, this uh, promised Davidic king from the Davidic covenant that will come and restore uh, Israel. And then uh, the other uh, major theme is Old Testament eschatology. So it's a very fancy word. Uh, I'm by no means an expert, but it talks about like the end thing. Zechariah uh, doesn't actually use the term the day of the Lord, but there's a lot of similar uh, ideas and characteristics about um, <coughs> about that. And so I hear you all flipping back into your notes okay. to write. And once you do, you can flip it back over. I have another bulleted <laughs> list and chart in there. Um, and so partly to take take it home with you, but also partly I thought this might be a little small thing to see. So you can see it in there. Uh, but there's a lot about um, kind of the how, where things are going, where things are going for Israel and the world. Um, and I tried to put verse references down on every bullet point, but he talks about a shepherd king is going to save Israel. A shepherd king uh, is going to be rejected and struck down. You'll see a lot of these have um, links to a lot of the messianic prophecies too. Um, you know, is, Israel will be gathered and restored. Nations uh, will war against Jerusalem, but they'll also be vanquished uh, by the Lord. Um, Israel will mourn for the one they pierced, um, and so on and so forth. And you can uh, take that list with you and read through it. Um, but a lot of how things are going to go for Israel, um, things that will happen when the Messiah comes, but then there's also some very end time things there too. Um, I'm going to throw this up there. This is more of like an academic question, I guess. And you can reference these charts, the Messianic Prophecies charts, and the list of how Zechariah viewed how things are going to go, the eschatology of things. Um, and so this is just kind of fun to, to talk about for a few minutes, uh, maybe five to ten minutes. Um, in what ways were the prophecies and expectations of Zechariah's ministry fulfilled in Jesus, and in what ways are they still expected? So go ahead and talk about that for five or ten minutes, and then we'll close it out. Oh, All right, I know we can spend probably hours talking about something like this. I gave you about uh, five to seven minutes. Uh, so what profound thoughts do we have? Things are yet to come. Yeah, for sure things are yet to come. Yeah. What specifically about this part did you see in that? Well, returning glory, rule of king, establish a new world order. Yeah. The roots are there. Yeah. On an individual basis, he can be king in your life. Mm -hmm. uh, in your new creature in yeah. Christ, but yeah. it doesn't, creation is still growing. Sure. Sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and, you know, this kind of is leading into the New Testament era, New Testament theology of the, the already and not yet, you know, that they call it the inaugurated eschatology, um, where it's here, but it's also yet to come. Um, and that happens with Jesus. A lot of these things are fulfilled, but then they're also fulfilled, but they'll also happen again and come again. So it's very, kind of has some double meaning there. Yeah. 
Yeah, so one thing I think is interesting in this table of prophecies, uh, all of them come from chapters 9 to 14, which is where we see the biggest focus yeah. on Messiah. Mm -hmm. But if we look earlier, um, one verse I think is really significant that we can see some fulfillment of Christ is in Zechariah 2, 10, and 11. Mm -hmm. It says, shout and, be God, shout and be glad, daughter of Zion, for I am coming and I will live among you, declares the Lord. Mm -hmm. Many nations will be joined with the Lord in that day and will become my people. Yeah. I will live among you and you will know that the Lord Almighty has sent me to you. Yeah. So there's this idea of God is going to come to dwell with his people and Israel itself is going to expand to have other nations brought into their identity. Which yeah. Find in the New Testament. The For sure. Gentiles are becoming part of God's people. Yeah. So, yeah. So Very cool. Stuff that yeah. And I love that about Zechariah. The very end of it is there were other nations like Egypt and everything making pilgrimages to Israel to worship Yahweh. Very mm -hmm. cool. Yeah. But Jesus didn't invent this idea of God caring about other nations. It's right. Old Testament. Yep. Very good. Thank you. Anybody else? We focus a little bit on the, just the fact that politics affects theology and that mm -hmm. during the Cold War, when everybody, you know, the doomsday clock and we realized yeah. we could blow ourselves up. In the, that the end times was a very hot topic. Right? Interesting, yeah. Because people realize it could be, if their nuclear war broke out, it could be the end time. And now that the Cold War is over, that's kind of gone away from our thinking and just sure fact that we need to be careful not to go to one street and the other. We know that God is coming so we to be obsessed by it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very good. All right, any other final thoughts before we hit the last book? <laughs> All right, let's do it. Malachi. Okay, would somebody like to read the purpose statement? Go ahead. <laughs> the prophet calls post-exilic Israel to repentance for the purpose of covenant renewal with Yahweh. This will enable the priests and people of God to restore proper temple worship and practice social justice within the community. All right, thank you. All right, so Malachi comes some, some decades after Haggai and Zechariah's prophetic ministry of rebuilding the temple, spiritual revival, and we just went through all these, uh, you know, Zechariah's chock full of messianic expectations and hopes and um, eschatology, things that will happen for Israel. Um, and then decades go by, decades go by, and some of these things seemingly aren't quite fulfilled yet, you know. Uh, what's going on? Uh, there's, I don't see any messianic age yet. Um, so some apathy starts to set, set in into Israel at this point, several decades late, later. And, you know, at this point they were allowed to return to their homeland from the, from the Persians after they defeated the Babylonians, but they're still kind of like a vassal of the Persian Empire. They're not like an independent state yet. So they're kind of under the rule of another nation, I don't see any Messiah yet. What's going on? Um, and so that's kind of the, the cultural climate that Malachi is prophesying in. Um, and so two major themes emerge throughout Malachi's book. One is marriage and divorce. And um, he uh, has some lofty teachings on the institution of marriage um, that... Uh, that are picked up later in the New Testament by Jesus and Paul, um, both for marriage and for divorce. Uh, you know, you uh, Jesus kind of rebukes Israel for um, divorcing, and they really point to, well, Moses allowed us to divorce, you know, by writing a certificate of divorce for unfaithfulness, and he rebukes them for saying, this was just kind of an accommodation for the hardness of your hearts. And so we start to see that theme emerge here in Malachi too. Um, and he uses this also as a symbol for Yahweh's relationship with, with the people. Um, it's a great covenantal uh, relationship that we can point to and see in our everyday lives that's a good picture of God's relationship with us. Um, and then also uh, in Malachi we see language about um, a forerunner to the Messiah, um, who is pretty clear... Uh, they're talking about like an Elijah figure, Elijah the prophet. Um, and so this, uh, this person's going to kind of lay the groundwork for the Messiah to come to turn Israel's heart in the right direction to be able to receive 
um, to receive the Messiah. And so we see later in the New Testament, obviously, that Jesus um, and the early church connect John the Baptist to this person that uh, Malachi was prophesying about. And um, so that's, that's where it comes in the Old Testament. And so I think we do have uh, about 10 minutes left. So uh, this idea of the cultural apathy, you know, I feel like we're kind of in a similar state where, you know, it's been 2,000 years since Jesus' ministry. He said, I'm going to come back soon. And we're here 2,000 years later. And there's still so much um, going wrong in the world, so much uh, pain and death and sin and suffering that and oftentimes we personally and as churches cry out, um, you know, Lord, where are you? Where, when are you coming? When are you, please come back soon. And Jesus even taught us to pray, Lord, your kingdom come. And we pray that um, every day. And so that we can still be in the same uh, dangerous position that Israel was in of growing apathetic to, well, you know, it's hard to live like the Lord is coming today when it's been 2,000 years, you know. Um, but we are commanded to live that way. And so uh, the question I have for you, we can spend about five minutes on it. Um, as we wait for Jesus to return and the kingdom of God to be fully realized, in what ways do we let that be set in today? So go ahead and talk, and then we'll wrap up and be done for today. Okay, who would like to... Share what you talked about. Go ahead, Rita. I think a, a little bit of it is we don't. And I got to go far. We yep. don't fully realize the majesty of our heavenly home. Yeah. I, we have no concept of what that is. Sure. And so, being like Peter said, you know, you think that. Why would why would that ha why would that be fulfilled in my lifetime? The kingdom of God be fully. Sure. Why would that happen in my lifetime? And I think we kind of just sometimes don't. And I also said long distance relationships are hard to keep up. That's true. So yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's kind of that aspect of like I don't really know when it's going to come, so you can get apathetic. There's also the other side of uh, which is I would say more dangerous of like oh I'm already forgiven. I mean, I'm going to be perfect when Jesus comes back. Why am I going to do all this hard work of <laughs> sanctification if Jesus is just going to come back and make it perfect anyways? Mm -hmm. I think apathy can set in that way, too. Go ahead, Gene. Um, a couple of us mentioned just the disciplines, you know, daily devotions, mm. taking Sunday to get some perspective, to worship, yeah. to tithe. There's some of these non-negotiables. Those keep, those keep the pace yeah. from going... You know, overdoing it and underdoing it. Just yeah. The, the spiritual disciplines that God gives us in our life to keep us running a marathon and not a sprint. Yeah. And just how we have to not let up on those. And yeah. They allow them. Yeah. For sure. Those. The spiritual disciplines really help with this kind of thing. Help us commune with God, with one another as a community. And yeah. Anybody else? Peter mentioned um, a family he knows that the church, during the pandemic, the church just was too dis would you say, just closed down or mm. they quit. And so yeah. people don't have, other than online, they didn't have a place to go. And yeah. It's kind of like. Yeah. And it, so, yeah. we live in a unique time with the pandemic and living in the 21st century where you can sit at home and watch church and mm -hmm. it can be easy to to lax on those spiritual disciplines because we are so, it's almost, it's good that it's accessible, but at the same time, you can't let that accessibility um, replace your effort in your own spiritual journey. Yeah. Okay, well, that's it, we did it. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. And what's coming next week, Zach? New Testament, it's coming next week. So, yeah, so we're, we'll be here next week doing New Testament uh, throughout May, I believe we have a plan. We'll have a steak right for Easter. Um, but yeah, keep coming because the journey hasn't stopped. Um, but this does mark the end of the chapter of Old Testament. Thank you for sticking with us, and um, we'll see you next week. <laughs>